And good morning to you too, our online family. Thank you for plugging in with us this morning. I feel like I say this every time, but I am so greatly encouraged when I hear what it is I'm going to speak on, spoken first in the prayer room and then through the praise and worship. So I feel like my job is done and see you tomorrow. <laughs> no, not really. But it's Sunday. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we are in his house. Hallelujah. So brace yourself, church. Anything could happen. Well, I'd like to start this morning by doing something that we don't often do, and that is by looking backwards. I'd like to start by looking at some of the messages, the messages we have had recently to remind us of what God has been saying to us. Back in February, Karen reminded us that we've been given the Holy Spirit for a reason. And she encouraged us to move forward in Christ and to eagerly seek and watch for the new things that he is doing in us and amongst us. Pastor Taylor reminded us that our God is powerful and fierce. He does not need our protection. And further, because his spirit lives within us, our faith should be an experiential faith, a faith that's hands-on, a faith that builds up, a faith that brings change and begets life. And the prophetic word that morning that Pastor Greg brought said that God was pouring out a refreshing and a new anointing upon us that we might take his message of life to others. And then for the past three weeks, Pastor Jordan has encouraged us to tuck ourselves up into God's presence to know who our God is and who we are to him and in him. And through Psalm 91 and Gideon's story in Judges, we were reminded that to advance in God will often mean a time to fight, a time to build, and a time to rest in his presence, all of which are to be done from our position in Christ, even though that position attracts attack. We were reminded that while we may not be out of Satan's sight, we are out of his reach. And in one of the songs we've just sung, uh, we were reminded too that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. So our messages have had strong themes of advancement, of exercising our faith, of knowing and trusting our God, of finding our peace and our rest in him. And today's message is titled, Do You Believe? And we've just sung, I Believe. Thank you to Pastor Jordan and to Pastor Taylor for allowing me to bring this this morning. So my text is from Matthew chapter 9, verses 27 through to 31. And these verses follow on from the miraculous healing of the woman with the issue of blood and the bringing back to life of a young girl, the daughter of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Matthew chapter 9. I did think briefly of gargling over the microphone. Matthew chapter 9, verses 27 to 31. Let's have a look at that together. I'm reading from the New King James Version. When Jesus departed from there, that is, from the young girl's house, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. 
And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. What did you see? What did you hear in those five verses? Well, I can tell you that I didn't see or hear anything much when I first read them. Jesus healed blind men again. But I knew this was our text for today, so I had another look. That didn't help too much. Although I was starting to identify with those blind men, and I was starting to do some calling out of my own, Jesus, have mercy! But back to our text in Matthew 9. And I'm going to read it to you again. This, front, this time from the New Living Translation, despite your eye rolls. After Jesus left the girl's home, two blind men followed along behind him, shouting, Son of David, have mercy on us. They went right into the house where he was staying, and Jesus asked them, Do you believe... I can make you see. Yes, Lord, they told him, we do. Then he touched their eyes and said, because of your faith, it will happen. Then their eyes were opened and they could see. Jesus sternly warned them, don't tell anyone about this. But instead, they went out and spread his fame all over the region. Who could blame them? And Matthew is the author of this account. He was a tax collector before he became a disciple of Jesus. He collected taxes and overpayments and bribes from his own people on behalf of the Roman government. And because he had his hand in the cookie jar, he was rather wealthy, but he was also rather despised. Now, Rome would not have placed any old Israelite with a biro in that accountable position. Matthew would have had skills. He would have been an excellent record keeper. And fortunately for us, Matthew continued to keep records after he left the tax collector's booth, and we have the book of Matthew as a result. And throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus regularly healing the blind, but this text only appears in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew, with his eye for detail and talent for record-keeping, thought this event worth capturing. And I think we can be confident that Matthew, the skilled record keeper, captured in these five verses all that we need to know. So what do we know? We have two blind men following Jesus, calling on him for mercy. They call him son of David, and by that they imply for all to hear that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And thanks to the writings of prophets like Samuel, Ezra, Isaiah, and Jeremiah, the Jews knew the promised Messiah would come from King David's line, and that the Messiah would enable the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the lame to walk, and the mute to sing. And if that sounds familiar, you just finish singing it. And perhaps 
Putting these two things together, the prophet's writings and the miracles that had just occurred, these blind men recognize that the man called Jesus is indeed the promised Messiah. So they follow him. And they let him know they know. Son of David, have mercy on us. And that was pretty bold. Opinion about Jesus was generally split three ways. Some believed, some didn't, and others were unconcerned and undecided. And some of the reasons people didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah are the same reasons people have today. Things like self-protection in all its various manifestations. Pride. Jealousy. Not fully understanding God's word. And there was another reason which still stands. Jesus was a bit of a shock to the system. His ways were so different to their ways that some considered him outrageously offensive. He did not fit their preconceived ideas of how the Messiah should be. He completely messed with their expectation of what the Messiah should look like and act like. It would seem in... The, oh, there's a zebra in the house. It would seem, in this instance at least, that our two blind men could see better than most men. Even so, Jesus does not turn around. Jesus, the Son of God, who came to set the people free, doesn't stop, doesn't turn around, and doesn't appear to even acknowledge the men. In fact, he appears to blatantly ignore the biblical law that mandated concern for the blind. He was supposed to show consideration for the blind, but here, Jesus only shows his back. And I reckon as the beggars these men probably were, they got a lot of that. But they persist. Son of David, have mercy. The son of David keeps walking. The son of David was a correct title for Jesus, but the people's understanding of it was not often complete. It was commonly thought that son of David referred only to the Messiah's earthly lineage, that he would be a descendant of King David. But as Matthew 22, Mark and Luke show us, the title also pointed to the Messiah's holy lineage and lordship over David. For Jesus is both the son of David and the son of God. Son of David, have mercy. The two blind men know to call upon Jesus and know to follow him but Jesus wants more for them. So he seeks more from them. He keeps walking. And as I see it, these two men had two options. They could keep following, or they could let offence, resentment, and discouragement speak far louder than their faith. Ah. Oh, we tried Jesus, but that didn't work for us. Is your Jesus some kind of herbal remedy? What is this? Why is he still walking? Hey, Jesus, heal us. Are you talking to your king? Or are you talking to Santa Claus? And thank you to Dr. Tony Evans for that line. Why do we have to go to him anyway? People come to us. That's how it's always been. Well, who are you following? Jesus or yourself? Sometimes we need to walk some things off. 
And sometimes we need to walk some things through. Beth Moore said, The most effective means the enemy has to keep believers from being full of the Spirit is to keep us full of ourselves. We need to walk off offence, walk off entitlement, walk off pride and prejudice. If Jesus is our Lord, then may he see it in our actions and hear it in our words. And these two men made the decision that Jesus was worth the pursuit and chose to press on. Son of David, have mercy on us. They persistently call on his name. No change. They follow Jesus the best way they can. No change. They know Jesus hears their prayers. No change. Jesus walks on. And these men must have been bewildered. But there is change. They just don't recognize it. If you follow Jesus, there will be change. There must be change. Because as Pastor Taylor reminded us, Jesus' presence brings the dead back to life and creates new things out of nothing. There will be change. It might not be what you're expecting, and it might not be immediately evident, but it will be good, because that's how God does things. These men want a healing. They don't have it. But what do they have? Well, they now have perseverance. They've chosen to press in no matter what. They now have courage. They've chosen to continue when they could well be excused for giving up and going home. They are being refined in their following. They are pushing past society's customs, their expectations, their comfort, their convenience. They believe Jesus holds their blessing. So they follow. Now Jesus could have answered their prayer when they first cried out. He'd done it for so many others before. But if he had healed them straight away, they may have been thrilled with him for a season. But ah, uh, you know, this life offers so many distractions. And now that we can see there's so many things for us to catch up on, why did Jesus heal us if he didn't want us to have a look around? With these men, or perhaps for these men, Jesus doesn't heal them immediately. And I think it's because he had so much more in mind for them. Has Jesus been slow? in answering you? Well, how are you going with that? Are you still following? Or have you fallen behind? When you think that God is too slow in answering your prayers, consider that he might be testing you. Now, testing, testing people is not a new thing for God. In Deuteronomy 8, Moses says to the Israelites, Be careful to obey all the commands I am giving you today. Then you will live and multiply, and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you, to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. 
So don't give up. But do get up and keep following. As Pastor Jordan says, keep doing what you know to do. There is a purpose, even if you can't see it yet. God doesn't do ordinary, even though we'd be happy to settle for that. He does extraordinary. In verse 28, Jesus reaches the house where he was staying and the two blind men go right on in. Now we might be a little surprised at that, but the custom of the day was to extend hospitality to those who knocked on your door. So perhaps that's why they so boldly entered in. Perhaps the homeowner, recognising the men were blind, honoured the law and showed the men some consideration. Or, perhaps the men had come too far to let anything come between them and their blessing. And Pastor Jordan mentioned last week that our Western custom is a little different when it comes to letting people in through our front door. And perhaps that's why we struggle with the notion that we may come boldly before the throne of God. Yet Hebrews 4.16 exhorts us to do just that. It says, So let us come boldly before the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Now, two men started off by saying the right words. But they had to follow that up, literally, with the right actions. And in the following came the refining. Before, they followed along behind. But now, they stand with. Before, they shouted at his back. Now, they speak to his face. Now, they stand in the house closer to the Son of God than most had ever been. Jesus accepts us just as we are. And then, he invites us into the refining process. And then he calls us higher still. The men stand before Jesus in the house. They stand face to face with him, even though their eyes did not tell, him so, tell them so. But I bet every fibre of their body knew it. And I think Jesus led the men into the house so they could stand before him there. But he wanted only the men. He didn't want their excuses, their distractions, their preconceived ideas and prejudice, their habits and rituals and usual ways. He wanted them in the house so their focus was on him alone because then they would be able to hear his word to them and they could respond. Jesus asks them, Do you believe I can make you see? And in that question, I think God is summing up their progress. He wants to know, Who am I to you? And in their response, we see the change. Do you believe I can make you see? Yes, Lord, they told him, we do. Their eyes may still be blind, but their heart definitely sees. No longer do they call him son of David. They call him Lord. Yes, Lord, they say, we believe. Our circumstances might not have changed, but our faith and trust in you has 
Yes, Lord, we believe. Then Jesus responds to their faith and touches their eyes, and they see. And perhaps the first face they ever see, perhaps the first anything they see, is the face of their Lord Jesus Christ. I imagine that moment would strengthen and sustain them for the rest of their life. So what do these two men have for us this morning? They were blind men, we're not. Well, not all the time anyway. They recognise Jesus as the Messiah. They follow him and don't care who knows it. They persist despite the circumstances. They follow the best they can. They go through a time of testing. They come boldly before Jesus and stand before him and know him as their Lord. In their following came the refining. And Jesus asks us the same question. Do you believe? Then follow. Do you believe I can? Then follow a little further. Don't let anything stop you from coming to me. Do you believe I can make you see? Then come, stand before me. What would change for you if you were to stand face to face with Jesus? What would change in you? Yet we have that privilege every time we pray. And especially when we stand together as his body in his house. Even if our physical eyes don't say so. Could I have the communion served please? Thank you. As I bring this to a close, we see in verse 30 that Jesus sternly warns the men to not say anything about what happened. But they can't help themselves and they are overflowing with what God has done for them. They spread Jesus' fame all over the region. From time to time, Jesus instructed people to keep quiet. I don't know why. One commentary said maybe he wanted to be known as more than just a healer because he came to be their saviour. So many people come to Jesus for what he could give them there and then. But Jesus came to heal souls as well as bodies and he came to restore people back to God. He came to do a complete work. And he did. And he still does. Through the glorious and enduring work of the cross. The other week we heard how the Old Testament priests laboured every day to bring sacrifices before the Lord in order to earn atonement and sanctification for the people. And because of Jesus... The believer's atonement and sanctification is complete through the finished work of the cross. Access to the Holy of Holies is granted. Access to the very throne of grace is ours through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Thank you. Jesus made the way for us. His body was broken that ours may be whole. His blood was spilled that we may be made holy, righteous and acceptable to God. What the priest laboured for day after day, Christ achieved once and for all time for all those who believe on him. 
Colossians 1.13 tells us that he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom with his blood and forgave our sins. And the same chapter goes on to say in verse 20, and through Christ, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Amen. Do you believe? Then let's take the wafer and the juice together as we remember him and confess together, yes, Lord, Yes, Lord, we believe. Amen. Thank you, church.